Hi. Um, so Adam told you all about the math, so I'll tell you all about the silly things that I make with it. Um, I'm Monica, I'm not Waldorf on Twitter and GitHub and internet places, and I work at Google on the Magenta team, uh, where I'm an engineer, I'm not one of the researchers, I don't actually do any of the math. Um, that's my cat, I am a cat person, I'm now gonna, dog, dog people are gonna stop here, that's it. Um, and if you've ever seen anything that I do, um, I make really silly things, and I call them silly things, and somebody like stopped me once at a conference, I was like, I don't know why you call them silly, they look really serious. And I realized that I use the word silly different than how people use it. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not serious or not important, I didn't take a lot of time where I don't really care about them, like they're my babies, I do all of these things, I'm obsessed with them. Um, but I call them silly because otherwise I would have to call them art, and art is kind of a loaded word, and I would never refer to something that I make as art, then like Monet and I are like in the same area code of interest, and that's really, really weird. It's a conversation for my therapist. Um, but if you call them, people get very serious and tense when you call something art, because we're taught to judge art. I'm an artist, oh, what kind of artist? Are you like a fine artist, or do you do things with computers? But if you call them silly, people get to relax and sort of enjoy and experience them, which I think is much funner. So I make silly things. This is one of the things that I made recently. It's called Midi City 2000, and uh, it literally builds cities out of rock and roll. Um, if you think about a melody, it's got these different instruments, they have different notes, and if you think about these notes coming over time, they have heights because they have pitches. So basically, a melody is made out of these like little neighborhoods of buildings, where the, the different neighborhoods are the different instruments, or the buildings are the notes. Uh, what song do you think this is? Obviously Aladdin, because the Magenta team stole my Aladdin from me. It's a whole new world. Um, but the thing is, once you think about melodies like this, you can start messing up with them. So you can decrease, you can decrease the density of buildings, or you can like just get rid of some of those rows. And what happens is that you get a new song. And it isn't a good song, but it's a different. It's a, it's a song, it's a song that didn't exist before. You remixed a whole new world and you got this thing. Actually, uh, I played with Aladdin for like 30 minutes and then I put it in GarageBand and it's my only SoundCloud song. It's, uh, it's wonderful. But these are the kind of things that I wanna build. This is the thing that I really like because it's both visual. You make beautiful new neighborhoods and cities that don't exist, but it's also a music instrument. You make music in a really strange way. Um, and this is, this is a silly thing, this is the thing that I do. And I make these things because it's good. Uh, I like it, I have fun making it, but it turns out it's actually objectively good to make things. Uh, there's this Business Insider article called, from like two years ago called, Why You Should Make Art Even If You're Bad. And hear me out, I tried so hard to make a joke about there being an art article on something called Business Insider, and I couldn't, so if you have one, please let me know. I have to give this talk again. But um, they have basically a whole bunch of like science-based studies about why making shit is actually really good for you. Turns out, if you do freeform art for like 30 minutes, your cortisol levels decrease. You literally get less stressed out and less anxious. Uh, if you doodle while you're like learning new concepts, you form different connections in your brain, and you remember them differently, and you can reason through things. Making things is objectively good. So I make these things because it's good for me, it's how I relax. But I also make these things so that you can make silly things with me, so that you can relax, and so that you can like reduce your stress by making a really weird song out of a whole new world or whatever MIDI you upload to it. This is why my favorite things that I build are the ones where you get to interact with. I'm not very good at static visual things or static art or anything like that. Um, I make things on the web because I'm obsessed with the web as a delivery platform where you can like go and click and make wonderful and delightful things out of it. Because to me, that's what generative art is. And that's not the definition of generative art that most people use. Generative art tends to be like whatever you produce out of an algorithm. But to me, generative art is something where you take my code and it's a little bit of you, and there's this like random surprise of delight that you didn't see coming. Um, the part of you is really important. I want it in some way to like extend your creative process because even if you don't think of yourself as a creative person, which is weird because you're a, something with art in the name, um, you are a creative person. Everybody has these creative ideas that they want to build. So this is the kind of generative things that I want to build. The first thing that I ever did on this topic was called Emojilate. And uh, fairly straightforward, you upload an image, I pixelate it, and I replace every pixel with an emoji of that color. Uh, you can zoom in and change the scale, and then like have more pixelated or less pixelated and more emoji. And I like it because A, emoji, and B, it's fun. But I thought it was a really weak example of what I believe to be generative art because 
two things were missing. Uh, your creative expression wasn't there. Sure, you're the person who uploads this taco. Uh, but you don't really get to control what it outputs out. You can't be like, I'm having a bad day, and I wanted this to be a really goth taco and only have, like, you know, rain clouds on it. Emojilate gives you what Emojilate gives you. You can't really control that. And that random delight wasn't really there either. Emojilate is really fun exactly once, because once you've emojilated an image, you know exactly what the second one is gonna look like. Once you've seen this taco, if I upload like a picture of my cat, you know pretty much how it's gonna work. But if you think about MIDI City 2000, even though I've shown you an entire melody, what it looks like, you have no idea what's gonna happen if you put in Mozart. You know what Mozart sounds like? And you can maybe imagine that a symphony has different instruments, but you don't know what they look like. And this is, that's why it's fun. Every melody that you upload, it's a weird different city that you didn't expect to look like, like that. Emojilate, not so much. And in order to fix this problem, because I was sort of stuck in a rut, and I'm like, well, I made a thing that's fun for like one use, I introduced rules, and I was really happy Mark talked about this, because I'm obsessed with rules in art, because I think they're really important. Rules in life are really important, but having rules in art, I find, simplifies the problem and forces you to be creative in a way that you're uncomfortable. Um, in particular, for, like, for a couple of years, everything that I made had to be about emoji. And once I set this rule that what I produce has to use emoji and has to look like an emoji, then the thing that I had to be creative about was how you interact with this emoji. How, what do the emoji do? Like, do you, do you move them? Do, you, do they react to things? Do you yell at them? What do you do with them? Um, and that's where the creativity came in. Now that I work on the Magenta team, so most of the things that I work are with music, everything that I produce basically starts with a MIDI file. And then the interaction is, well, what can you do with a MIDI file? Well, you make it into a city, obviously. The next thing that I built was Emoji Garden. Uh, and Emoji Garden being, en ended up being a stupidly popular project. Like, Monica Lewinsky and Susan Kerr from like different world, ends of the world tweeted at it, tweeted about it, which I thought was incredibly strange. These are people that I've heard of. Um, my mother didn't care about it, on the other hand. <laughs> Irony. Um, and Emoji Garden was also straightforward. It basically generated a random garden of emoji for you. And you can control the grid, and you could refresh it, and you would get this like pleasing little garden over and over again. But to me, this was again a failed art experiment, because it wasn't generative art in that way that I wanted generative art to be. There's not a lot of your creative process in here. Sure, you're the person who refreshes this image over and over again, but you can't control what's in this, gar in this garden. Maybe carrots killed your family and you don't want carrots in your garden. Tough luck, emoji garden don't care. Um, so then I sat on it, I was like, well, sweet. Some people like it, failed experiment. But it actually ended up being a hugely successful generative art experiment because of the platform that I built it on. Uh, it was built on something, it's built on something called Glitch. So Glitch is a new platform where you can write code and like look at other people's code and look at their output. It's kind of like the good days of GeoCities where we learn from viewing other people's source. Um, Glitch lets you host these little, little projects and sort of learn from other people and get inspired by other people. And in particular, encourages remixes. It encourages you to take somebody's project, remix it, and make it your own. And to me, this remixing is sort of the premise of generative art. You take something that exists there and you like jiggle it and shimmy it and it becomes something else that's yours. So what ended up happening is that people took Emoji Garden and they made their own gardens. They generated more things from it. They made hedgehog gardens that only had hedgehogs and no other animals were invited. They made desert island gardens, which were terrifying, had spiders and crawlies and basically no vegetation at all. Hello, Las Vegas. Uh, they made skies. My friend Jane Solomon made this. She's not a programmer. She's a linguist. She works for dictionary.com. She makes words for a living. And she was like, I want to make a garden where it's a sky because, you know, it's really rainy outside. And she made it. And it's a one, and every time you refresh it, you get a new little sky. And sometimes it's nighttime and sometimes it has owls. You got a really weird thing. This is Emoji Voidscapes. It's my favorite. Uh, it's, uh, it's got voids and black balls and magic. Uh, sometimes you get eyeballs and syringes and clocks of doom that say soon end. Its <laughs> contrast is really bad. And it's ominous as fuck and I love it. This is the kind of thing that I wanted somebody to make with it. So the surprise here wasn't my project. It was Glitch, the platform that I built it on. The art itself that I made wasn't generative in any way, but it became generative because of where I delivered it and, and what it was built on and the platform that it lived on. Because what I realized is that we don't make art in a void. We make art for other people to look at. We make art with other people's tools. Uh, the things that we use end up shaping what this art looks like. If I take, if you, if you give an incredibly prolific oil painter who is an expert at painting with oils, and you take away his oils and you just give him marbles, and you're like, well, 
good luck, make something with this. They'll still make something because they're still a creative person, but it's going to look wildly different than what it was going to look like if they had you know, their oil pain paintings. So in this real, weird online world that we live in, the code that we use, the devices that we view this code on, the way we distribute it, all of these shape the end result of the things that we produce. And I think this is really important. So we have to think about these tools in a creative way. But in the same way, we have to think about code in a creative way. Because if you wanna build visual things or visual tools for people to build visual things, the kind of code and libraries that you pick end up helping or stunting the thing that you're gonna produce. If you think about a library like Processing or P5, which is a library that's literally built for visual arts. The goal is for you to draw things on the screen really fast. If you want to build visual things with it, you're going to have a way easier time using something like Processing than if you use something like C++ that was used for like reading files real fast. That's not to say that you can't make art in C++. There's the entire video games that I make about it, and I, I'm gonna argue that video games are art. Um, but it's just gonna be harder. And the problem is that the more time you have to like spend wrangling this code and making this platform that doesn't wanna be visual, be visual, then you have less time to think about, well, what's the creative thing that I wanna do with this? So this is why I think it's important for us to work on creative code and code that helps other people be creative. One of the reasons why Emoji Garden was so successful for other people to remix is because it was built on libraries that, that helped it do this. It was built on something called Tracery.js. Uh, which is a library built by Key Compton for procedural art. It's a fantastic library. People use it to uh, generate levels for video games or to generate stories that follow particular rules. Uh, and I use it to generate gardens of emoji. And the, the way tra tracery works is fairly straightforward. You define a pattern and whatever you generate follows that pattern. In my, in my world, it was just a pattern of tokens. Uh, M is for like model, I don't remember why I called it model. V is for visitors, little animals that can appear, and S was for snacks, like little food accidents that happen. And then the other thing that you define is uh, the world, the values that these tokens can actually take. So for example, your visitors can be like Mr. Mouse, a hedgehog, and a Twitter bird because you like yourself but also hate yourself a little bit. Um, and, then what, and then you just give these two things a tracery, and what tracery does, it, it starts like replacing all of these tokens with a random piece of the world, and it does this until it's done. So basically, if you wanted to remix Emoji Garden and make your own garden, all you had to do was just change the values of these world tokens. You didn't have to know what other code I wrote in there to like display the emoji or like how the, generate, the random button works or anything like that. You just wanted to change what gets displayed in the world. So this is why like non-programmers took it and they were like, I made my own garden. I don't even know what a JavaScript is. Great. And what I realized here is that this is a really important thing. Tracery.js is a really important library built by a serious person that people use for serious things, like, you know, again, making games and stories and stuff. But you can also use it to make a grid of ominous eyeballs that tell you that the doom is soon. Um, and I think that's really important because art doesn't have to have a point. There's no point in Emoji Garden. There's no point in, you know, the Voidscapes Garden. Uh, but it's, and it's fine if you don't get it. Somebody out there get, gets it. I really enjoy the Voidscape Garden. Um, so that means that somebody has to make it. And if we agreed in the past, because Business Insider told us we should, that making things is objectively good, then helping people build these things is also objectively good, and it's important, because otherwise people wouldn't be able to build things. Um, and I realized most importantly that this was like a thing that had meaning to me. This was a thing that I worked, wanted to work on, and that's why I work on Magenta now. Because the entire goal of the Magenta team is to sort of build algorithms, build models, build tools so that creative people can do something with them, so that they can extend your creative process. Because for better or for worse, worse, machine learning is everywhere now. It's in all of the software that you use to give you better ads that are more tailored towards you. If I go on my Instagram, Instagram has me like pegged to a T. It shows me like shoes, cats, and like weird gadgets and makeup. Um, and it figured this out because of a machine learning algorithm that was like, Monica clicks on these things, gotta show her more of these. So it can help us with like really serious problems like self-driving cars and cancer cells, but machine learning can also help us just make better fun things. And I don't mean like automating art or automating music because I don't find that very interesting. That's how you get elevator music. That's sort of like computer generated but sounds terrible and you never put it in your living room. I don't make making art for me. I, make, I, want, I wanted to make art with me. I wanted to make music with me. Because in my house, technology is everywhere. I have a water faucet in my kitchen that's literally voice activated. I tell it how many cups of water to dispense and it does it. Uh, my garbage is uh, 
I can also tell the garbage to open, but I can also wave my hand in front of it. Everything in my house has computers now. Uh, but I still make music in the same way that I did 10 years ago. I sit at a physical keyboard and I bang on it, a piece that I've memorized, and I still don't know how to compose and I still don't know how to improvise. But computers know how to help me compose and they can teach me how to improvise. So what I want is, you know, better, weirder, more surprising, more inspiring, more configurable. Oh, you guys can't see the text. Oh, that's tragic. <laughs> oh, it says like with me and oh, well, come see me after, it's really pretty. Um, but yeah, I want these like better, more inspiring, more configurable interfaces for music that sort of like let me play and like help me a lot along the way, like training wheels for music. Uh, like this interface, so uh, Adam mentioned uh, Taro, which is a prolific Magenta JS user and developer, uh, as in he uses Magenta JS to make awesome things. This is uh, Incredible Spinners, which is a little interface to make music. He generated this grid of melodies with music VAE, and then he made them in such a way that when you move up and down the columns, it's, uh, it's the same melody but in a different key, and when you move sideways, it actually changes the melody slightly, it changes the tones. Um, so you can build songs by just hovering over these circles, and it sounds like this. And you can do this forever, and it sounds awesome. And you can actually make songs, and then you can like you know put them up in MIDI, and then take them to Ableton and do whatever you want with them. Uh, yesterday we ran a Google Doodle, and it was really exciting. This is using one of our coworkers Anna's model that knows how to uh, infill a four a four voice chorale by Bach. So Bach used to make a lot of chorales where he had like. Uh, four voices, soprano, tenor, alto, and bass. Um, and what we do here in the doodle is that you draw the melody, so sort of the soprano voice, and then the machine learning model infills the other three voices as close as you could imagine that Bach could do this. Because again, we didn't, as Adam told you, we didn't put any rules in everything. We just basically fed it 300 pieces by Bach and we're like, go figure it out. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, and that's kind of interesting. And along with the Doodle, we also shipped this, uh, this app that I built, which lets you sort of build bigger melodies and sort of modify more what the result of the model is. So here our, um, uh, our coworker Doug, our manager, uh, you can draw a melody and it's the slightly legal version of Seven Nation Army. And then we can give Seven Nation Army to the model and then it's gonna crunch a little bit and it's gonna come up with three other voices that make a box Seven Nation Army chorale. But you can also configure the model and be like, I want it to be less random, I want it to be more rigid, have longer chords, uh, you know, stop improvising so much. So you can do that and then it's gonna sound slightly simpler. And then you can do the opposite, crank that temperature up, make it on fire, have incredibly random notes that would make Bach horrified because he would never write something like this. And again, it doesn't sound great, it doesn't sound perfect, and that's fine, mistakes are great, because now, even in this app, you can like start erasing the notes you don't like, you can like add more notes that you think should be there, you can maybe infill, you can export this to MIDI and again take it to your favorite music maker, you can put it in GarageBand, you can do whatever you want with it. But if you're, not, if you're like me, a person who doesn't know how to improvise, I played with this, I made a little Bach piece that I was comfortable with and then I took it to my piano and I played it and I was incredibly happy. This is a, you know, an interface for music that I didn't have before that actually helped me make music. And it doesn't have to be on the web, it's on the web because that's the thing that I do. Uh, but you can make physical awesome interfaces out of this. This is something called Piano Genie, uh, made by one of the Magenta residents, Chris Donahue, where instead of playing 88 keys on a piano, why not play eight and sound better than I could?
And this is just another model that, like, similar to Music VA, that just looked at a lot of piano to sort of learn how to summarize it and just associated a bunch of notes with one button. And it's not all about music. We make a lot of music, as most of our team is musicians. I really care about art. You can also make art with machine learning. Uh, style transfer was a question that was asked. Style transfer has been a thing that everybody has been working on for the last five years, and it's this ability to take the style of a picture and slap it on a different picture. So here I have Einstein, and I also have the scream, so I can get the screaming Einstein, or the Monet Einstein, or you know the Monet logo of this conference. I can do all of these things. It's like the world's fanciest Instagram filter, but on your browser, and it takes like four lines of code. And I'll show you that in a second. Adam also showed you uh, the sketch model where like, we've learned how to draw cats from other people drawing cats. Uh, and he said that we look at the, one of the things that we can do is look at the, the strokes and learn how to continue strokes. So I built this really silly app called Magic Sketchpad where you draw a blob and then the, the model just continues that blob based on the category that he selected. So here I draw a cat and then I pick from a bunch of cats that are continued and then I can also draw a crab because crabs are things that we know how to draw. And a, a truck that's actually at the bottom is getting some wheels right now and a whale. And like this is obviously not art. I'm not calling it art by any stretch of imagination. This is like even for my limits, this is a bit on the low side. But this also took me an, less than an evening to build. I literally like one afternoon I was talking to Adam and I was like, I think I'm gonna do this thing. And the next day it was ready. And I didn't spend a lot of time and I'll show you a little bit of the code uh, later. But all of this was really easy because I had an idea and there was a tool here to help me. And that was Magenta.js. So Magenta.js is the, oh, God, I'm so, so saddened by these texts. Um, and Magenta.js is the library that we provided uh, and it's an open, open source library. Uh, it's got all of the pre-trained models and a bunch of like very simple APIs on top of that because machine learning is not easy. Uh, if you played with a doodle yesterday and you think like it works amazingly well with no matter how much garbage you put in it, it took like six months of training a model. It took one of our coworkers like literally just like changing some numbers from some numbers to another number and then waiting a, a day for the model to retrain and be like still slightly bad, let's add an extra decimal point somewhere. Like machine learning is super finicky and it's a black box and it takes a lot of like researchers to make it go. But that doesn't mean you need to know how that works. I don't really know how to build a piano and I can still play the piano crap really. There's nothing stopping me. So Magenta.js is there to help you. And now I wanna show you a little bit of the code just so you can believe me it's actually that simple. Uh, Adam showed you the, the music VAE trios and then that's also what's used in those spinning circles. So you basically create a model, you ask it to give you a sample, you create a player, and then you tell it to play that sample. And even the player here is super abstract because if you've ever tried, making uh, sounds come out of a browser is really horrible and a pain, but Yotam was gonna talk later, made a library called Tone.js that we like absorbed into Magenta so that you don't have to worry about you know, making, uh, making your browser make sounds. We've got that covered for you. Um, now that you have the sequence, so this is all, yeah, this is literally all the code. Now that you have the sequence, maybe you wanna do that Bach infilling. You literally create that coconut model, which is the model that knows how to infill Bach, and then you ask it to infill that sequence, and what it gives you back is another sequence, and then you tell the player, well, play that sequence now. Maybe you want the crazy model that had eight buttons and controlled a piano. Surprisingly, that's not actually that hard either. You just create your model, and then you ask it to give you the next note that fits you, you know, banging on this one button, and you do that over and over and over again until the player stops playing. And when I say it's not really hard, I mean there's actually a lot of code that goes behind the scenes, but you don't need to care about it because you're the person who has an idea. You want to make, I don't know, this microphone sing or you want to make somebody's, uh, whatever colors they're wearing sort of affect the music in their room. And you can do that because that's, why we build, that's how we built Magenta.js, to be really simple so that you can do that. We can do that for images too. Images aren't really hard either. You create the model. You give it the source image and the style image, and here I'm not being fancy, I literally mean, mean the HTML style image uh, or the image tag. And then it gives you back a bunch of data that you can just shove into a canvas and paint it to the screen. And that's how you style your image. And this is all simple because it was a deliberate decision to make it simple. We don't wanna be fancy. We don't want you to necessarily know how hard it is to make these things. We just want you to make these things. Because one of the things that I think is really important is that code should never hold back art. Uh, there's artists out there who have great ideas and at the moment we sort of require them to also be incredibly good engineers or programmers. And that's gonna limit the amount of art that we can create with these computers or in these algorithms. 
Um, think about your favorite artist. One of mine is Degas. Degas didn't make his own pastels. He like bought them from Sennelier, who was fantastic and spent his entire life making chalk pastels. Uh, Yo-Yo Ma plays the cello. He doesn't make his cello in the weekends. He like has other hobbies. He goes around the world and tells people about ethics and music and computers. Um, but we shouldn't make our own cellos and we shouldn't necessarily make you know, our own machine learning. We can use other people's. Marshall McLuhan has this quote that the medium is a message. It's like super popular and everybody's read it before. Um, but it's actually true and I think it's becoming more and more true again with machine learning. How you deliver things influences how the message is perceived. The medium in which you use these models hugely affects uh, how these models are perceived and like it's a reflection of your creative process. If I just generate, you know, not to shit on it, but if we just use uh, Adam's like infinite trios, sure, your browser is making infinite trios, but that doesn't really, you know, make it art or make it super interesting. But how you use it is really good. Maybe you, you know, put it into an ambient music, again, that reacts to other people, where people interact with it, and then it becomes art. How you, the engineer, and how you, the author of an art, and how you, the person interacting with these art, all come together, that's where the things are interesting. Um, I want to show you this example. Uh, this is a recent installation by Mario Klingemann called Memories of a Passerby. And it uses GANs, you know, the creepy face generators that, uh, that Adam showed you. But he uses them by, first of all, applying a, an image style to them. And he does this in an infinite sort of installation. As you come in into the installation, it generates every like 10 or 15 seconds a new portrait and it morphs through them. Uh, and you can just sit there and watch it. I think it got lit recently sold for something like 50,000 50, pounds or something like that. This installation wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. We didn't have the GANs, we didn't have the algorithms, we didn't have the computing power to generate infinitely many portraits, but more specifically, a human could have never generated infinitely many paintings. When we go to a museum, all of us in the room, we look at the same painting. We can't afford to each of us have our own individual intimate experience with this painting. We have to share it because there's only one Dali and there's only one Monet and they've only painted the things that they've painted. But now we can take artists that paint in a particular way and make infinite of those if that's the thing that they want to do. This other installation is also really recent and I love it. I, like, I'm obsessed with it. It's by Robbie Barrett and Ronan Barrow. Similar names, different people. Um, Robbie Barrett is uh, an artist that does a lot of art with machine learning and AI and he's codes it and he's an engineer. Ronan Barrett is, an, is a painter. Um, so what they did here together is that uh, Robbie generated a bunch of in, uh, infinitely many skulls with, again, in the style of Ron and Barrett. So here's, again, this idea of, like, we're not displacing artists. We're just using them. We're not using the artists. I mean, if they want to be used, you know. Um, but you can partner with artists to make these, like, super creative things that couldn't exist before. So what happens in this installation is that you go to this box and you go and look in the, uh, through the peephole. And what's going to happen is you're going to get shown one skull that is painted, in the style of Ronan Barrett and is generated by a GAN. And you look at it for five to 10 seconds and then it disappears forever. And it's marked into the algorithm in such a way that it's this skull that you've seen will never get generated again. This was your skull. This was your intimate experience with incredibly ephemeral art. Um, the next person that comes here will see a different skull also in the style that Ronan Barrett painted. Um, but it's going to be a different skull. It's not going to be the same skull. Nobody will see the same art ever again. This was an art that existed for 10 seconds. And again, this wouldn't be possible without machine learning. It wouldn't be possible without computers. Who has time to generate? I don't even have time to generate one cat drawing for everybody here in the room, and I'm not even that talented. Imagine if I were talented and it took me weeks to do this. This installation was shown alongside a, you know, a static art installation where Ron and Barrett actually painted these skulls so you could see the physical art in this weird, weird machine learning ephemeral art, uh, which I think is fascinating. I'm gonna leave you with this quote by Brian Eno um, that, I, that I learned about when I joined the team, which is that whatever you now find weird, ugly, uncomfortable, and nasty about a new medium will surely become its signature. The distorted guitar sound is the sound of something too loud for the medium supposed to carry it. Um, everything you love at one point was weird. There was a time before we had electric guitars. I know, it's gonna blow your mind. We didn't used to have guitar pedals. We didn't used to have pop music, uh, rock music, impressionism, cubism, Swedish chairs that you assemble in your house. All of these things were at some... Helvetica. Helvetica. Uh, all of these things that you then now use and you take for granted were at some point, you know, looked down on by most likely a white man in the room. Um, not in the room, but like, you know what I mean. Um, 
And making art with music and algorithms and computers is not in any way different. It feels uncomfortable, it's really new. We're not really good at it. We generate a lot of things that kind of look weird and ugly. But we're going to get better. We got really good at pop music. We make a lot of money out of it. So just because it's uncomfortable, it doesn't mean we shouldn't encourage it to grow, we shouldn't build tools for it, and we shouldn't like be excited about what it's going to do. So I think building serious things is really important. I think focusing on real issues like infrastructure and you know solving diseases and self-driving cars is important. But I also think that building silly things and having fun is really important and creating art and music. Um, and I want more of us to do this. And I think this means that you know some of us have to start building these serious things like Glitch and Magenta and GANs um, in a way that's targeted not necessarily, again, at doing the really serious thing like curing cancer, but at generating a random painting of a skull that you can look at for 10 seconds and then it disappears forever. Thank you. Thank you.